Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. Uh, I'm Chris Cottrell, and this is part eight of my series on the formation of the Carolina Bays. Uh, if you're new to the series, or you just want to refresh your mind on the vast amount of information we've been covering uh, so far, just go ahead and click on the link above and uh, watch the series from the beginning. Uh, well, over the past few segments, uh, we've been looking at other forms of evidence that link the Carolina Bays to a younger Dryas causing impact into the Laurentide Ice Sheet at a location we now call Saginaw Bay. Um, in this part, we're going to take a look at the massive amounts of glacial meltwater that flooded across the continent directly following an impact that took place some 12,900 years ago. Uh, these North American mega floods are pretty well accepted by geolo uh, geologists today. You know, however, their causes are still highly debated. Uh, most scientists today cite the periodic flooding of a pro-glacial body of water called Lake Agassiz. Um, supposedly, while the massive ice sheets were melting away at the end of the last ice age, some of this meltwater began to collect behind ice dams, growing to enormous volumes. Well, eventually these ice dams would fail and the surrounding areas would be pounded by devastating floods. Now, ironically, the last time this happened, which also happens to be the exact same time we're now finding a black mat layer in the uh, soil records, evidence of mass extinctions across the globe, you know, that almost included our own species, and the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling event, you know, Lake Agassiz contained more water than all of the Great Lakes combined. I find that pretty ironic. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and when those ice dams broke, the incomprehensible volumes of water, you know, rushed north, north up the Red River Valley, south down the Mississippi, and up to the northeast uh, down the St. Lawrence River Valley. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Lake Agassiz was completely made up to fit the outdated uniformitarianism idea ideologies uh, of our time, uh, but I do think uh, things have been a bit exaggerated to fit those notions. Um, a much more plausible explanation, in my opinion, uh, for this massive outburst of glacial meltwater would be a cometary impact, you know, right, right here into the Saginaw Bay. Uh, and you can, <laughs> right into that Saginaw Bay uh, region of the Great Lakes. Uh, while the impact would have sent a tremendous amount of ice hurling through the sky to eventually create the Carolina Bays, um, you know, which is what this presentation is all about, but the craters left left behind in the actual ice sheet itself would have quickly filled, would have quickly filled uh, up with an unimaginable mix of glacial meltwater, icebergs, and boulders. So much so um, that I'm really starting to believe that the Great Lakes themselves were created by this erosive torrent before it spilled across the continent in multiple directions. Okay, so for the first example of this, I want to show you uh, the channeled scablands of Eastern Washington. Uh, now, while probably this is the most popular example, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, mainly for three reasons. Uh, the first one is, you know, the pictures really explain themselves. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that a massive flood occurred in this, in this area. Uh, the second one, you know, while this flood was likely to over, uh, you know, be an overflow extension of the one that we're currently talking about, uh, it could equally be from a separate event uh, related to another pro-glacial lake called Lake Missoula. And that's, you know, they are connected. They, they are together there. Um, you know, but same process at the same time, just different sources of water. And then number three, you know, this man right here, Randall the Rosetta Stone Carlson, explains it all. You know, I, I call him the Rosetta Stone because, you know, not only is he a brilliant person, but... He is one of the first people to really help me see the bigger picture and to make those connections with the mysteries of the past and real geology that we see today. Um, I highly encourage you to visit any one of Randall's uh, websites. Uh, in the, I have them in the description below or click on the link above to hear him talk about the channel to Scablands. Uh, the next example is probably the most obvious one. Uh, even today, the Mississippi River is one of the largest rivers in the world. Uh, however, the river itself is dwarfed uh, when compared to the valley it's contained in. Again, based on these somewhat outdated principles of uniformitarianism, uh, the Mississippi River Valley was, you know, should have been formed over millions of years as the Mississippi River meandered back and forth. Uh, and yes, while I agree that this works on a smaller scale over a long period of time, um, I think we're going to find that these larger scale features uh, were likely formed by a much more abrupt processes like the ones that we're currently talking about. Um, you know, these two pictures down here, 
you know, these aren't the Mississippi River, but they're one of its thousands of tributaries, uh, the Minnesota River. Uh, and you can see, you know, how big the river is now compared to the total volume of water that the valley likely held when it was formed. You know, this rapid pulse of fresh water uh, and extremely cold glacial meltwater uh, can easily be used to help explain the shutdown of the Gulf Stream um, that has been attributed to the onset of the Younger Dryas, as well as the massive amounts of sediment that is built up on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, now while probably the most, you know, not the most popular, I'm finding the floods of the Northeast to be the most interesting. The terrain of the entire tri-state and New England areas um, are a direct result of the proximity to the proposed Younger Dryas impact site. You know, we have long known that the St. Lawrence River was a major route of glacial meltwater at the end of the last ice age, um, but the amount of water and energy that flowed through this area can be seen everywhere. Uh, and if we were to remove all the vegetation and ground cover from the Northeast, we would find a landscape that far exceeds the devastation of the Scablands. Um, keep in mind that all of the interesting geological features we see here happened after the last glacial maximum as the glaciers were retreating. Features like the Finger Lakes of upstate New York, uh, the Drumlin Fields, you know, these tear shaped mounds of till uh, have a checkered past, much like the Carolina Bays, and really deserve their own video series uh, all by themselves. Uh, the sheer cliff faces of John Boyd Thatcher State Park, uh, you know, complete with hanging, let's sit right here, complete with hanging waterfalls. Uh, these are found miles away and high above the banks of the current Hudson and Mohawk Rivers. You know, and then we can also look at the river valleys themselves, just the massiveness of the river valleys uh, that we find in these areas. Oh, and speaking of the Finger Lakes, do they look familiar at all to something else we've been talking about? <laughs> now, if if we follow the path of, ma of the massive torrent of water uh, that would have likely to been carried away from Lake Ontario and, and on down the Hudson River Valley, we find more vertical cliff banks like the Palis uh, what, how do you say that? Palisades of New Jersey. Uh, but probably the most telling feature of this, uh, of this world changing event has to be the Big Apple itself, New York, Staten Island, the islands of Manhattan and Brooklyn, along with the rest of Long Island. These were built on top of the terminal moraine of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. So basically, if you think of a glacier like a giant slow moving bulldozer, um, all the sediment or till gets piled up in front of it as it advances forward. But when the temperatures warm up, you know, enough for the glaciers to retreat, that very last moraine gets left behind. Well, ironically, because of this same process, Long Island is the farthest north we find evidence of Carolina Bays. Not that the ice didn't fall in places like Connecticut, it's just all of the unconsolidated material was plowed away during the Ice Age. Now, when, when this event took place 12,900 years ago, the floodwaters traveling down the Hudson River Valley completely cut right through that terminal moraine on its way to the sea, leaving us with features that we have, you know, that we have to live with today, you know, like the uh, George Washington Bridge. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I, I better go ahead and stop there. But before I go, uh, I, I want to point out, or I want to point you in the direction of one of Antonio Zamora's most recent videos. Um, he's been on a roll. And uh, if you click on the link above, it'll take you to uh, some of the most compelling evidence for the Carolina Bays that I've seen in a long time. Um, also, for the next part of, in this series, I'm going to be focusing on various myths, legends, and folklore uh, that seem to point in the direction of the Carolina Bay slash Younger Dryas causing impact. And I want to include some of you guys and gals. <laughs> so let's have a little fun uh, with this one. And uh, if, if you've been watching and have, have a suggestion for uh, one of these ancient tales that I you know, just have to include in my next presentation, uh, drop me a line in the comments below, and if I use your suggestion, you know, I'll make sure, I'll be certain to give you a shout out and, and uh, make sure that you get the credit that you deserve. All right, everyone. Uh, you know, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.